Hi everyone, Rebel Coder here. Today we are going back to DNA Toolkit and we're going to add two more functions, translation function and code on usage function. So let's go to the browser right away. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to use a DNA codon table, which is presented here. And we're going to use a short version of the notation instead of the three letter notation. This notation is also used in all of the databases I've seen so far. So DNA codons are these triplets we can generate from our DNA or RNA string. And then we can have these amino acids and build our protein from them. Here's yet another image. This uses an RNA string as a base for codon generation, these nice triplets here. We're going to use DNA as our base. And again, that's the DNA codon table we're going to use. When we're done with the DNA, we're going to add an RNA codon table support as well. But this is very trivial as well, as you will see. If you're not sure what DNA codons are, I suggest this video and I'm going to link that as well. Okay, so last two functions we'll add it or GC content and GC content in subsequence. Let's quickly run it. So this is the result we've got last time. Today we're going to add 0.7 and 0.8. So the first thing we need to do is go back to our structures and we have our DNA nucleotide structure and DNA reverse complement structure. We need one more structure. It is a big structure, which is a DNA codons. And I have created that for you so you don't have to type it. You can copy that from a GitLab repository. And I'm also going to link directly to this file in the video description. Okay, so here it is. And as I mentioned, we're going to use a short versions of the notation instead of three letter notation. And we're marking M as a start codon. This is just a comment and underscore as a stop codon. Okay. So let me save this file, go back to our DNA toolkit. Okay, so here's our new function. It's called translate seek. It's a one line of code function, as you can see, and it accepts a sequence, a DNA sequence and initialization position, which is set to zero by default. We're not going to use this initialization position right now. We're going to need that to generate reading frames. When you generate reading frames, you should generate six of them. And we're going to need this parameter to actually shift our reads. But again, we're going to see that in our next videos. So we're using very similar approach as we're using our other functions. We're using our nice dictionary of structures right here to find corresponding values from the keys we provide. And again, we are using jumps of three. So let me just do this here, for example, okay, just a string. Because codons, as we've seen from our image, are not read like that. First three, then we shift another three, then we shift another three. This is not how it works. We need to shift by three and read three letters, which is like that, then next three, then next three. This is why we are going through our DNA codon dictionary, getting a three nucleotide sequence, and then we're telling it jump three, Next time, read these three, jump three, re read these three, and then basically match them against what you find in DNA codon table. Let's see how this works. Let's go back to our main function and add our sevens printout. Let me copy and paste that from my snippets here. Okay, let's run this right now. We can see we have generated a sequence of amino acids right here. So the first one is G, and it is being generated by GGT. We can go back to our sequences and search for GGT. And it is G. So the next one is F. And it is generated by TTT, triple T. Let's go back to structures, TTT. And it is F. Next one is very interesting. It's a stop codon, stop reading codon. And it is generated by TAG. And the stop codons are right here, T, A, G, and so on. Next thing is more of a Python tip. We are passing two things to this function, DNA string and a parameter where to start reading from. We don't really have to specify it in this case. Let's try running it again. And it still works. Because if we're going to go back here, we can see that we initialize position to zero like this. It is a default value. Meaning if we're not passing anything to this function, it is going to 
be zero by default. If we're gonna take this away now, like that, and we're gonna try running it, it is going to tell us that it's missing one parameter. That way we have to specify it this way. Okay, now it's back to working. So specifying default values like that is a very good idea. In a case if you don't need any additional settings to run the function, it will run on the default settings, or if you forget about this parameter, it's not going to stop the execution of your code. So let's try actually passing something more than a zero to that, to actually shift our reads. Let's run it in the original way like that again. And we can see that this is the string we've got. And it ends about here. Let's try removing zero and setting it to five, let's say. So we're going to try reading from a fifth nucleotide. Let's run it again. We can see that sequence is a bit shorter. And the first one is V. So it started reading from a fifth position. So one, two, three, four, five. So it's G, T, C. Let's go back to our thing. G, T, C returns V. And again, this is very useful functionality for generating reading frame because we're going to shift positions from zero to one to two. Okay, so let's add our second function. It is called codon usage. It's more of a statistical function. We're giving it a string of DNA or RNA and telling it, can you please count the frequency, the occurrences of a particular amino acid we're gonna pass to you. This looks like a very complicated function, but it's not. It's very similar to what we did in translate sequence function. Only two additional steps we take is when we loop through that sequence, instead of returning every single amino acid, we are checking, oh, is it equals to that amino acid that we want to build the statistics on? If it is, then append it to our list. Here we are using a counter. If you might remember, we use counters here as a additional solution. Counter just creates a dictionary where it sets a key as a value of a dictionary and the value of that key, how many times that key appeared in a list. So this is very useful to kind of build a statistics dictionary. Here we are summing up all of the values in that dictionary and just to use it in here to calculate the frequency, the percentage. Okay, so let's try outputting the output of that function. Let's print out the output number eight, which is our codon frequency. And we're going to tell it, here's our string that we use all over our code here. And can you find the occurrences of L amino acid? Let's save and run. And here it found these three occurrences on our initial run. It is very surprising because this is a randomly generated string and it does not represent any biological, real biological DNA sequence. So most of the times it won't even find anything. But here we can see it found L three times. One, two, three, L, L, L. Let's try running it a couple more times and see what it finds. Found just once, nothing. Okay, just to recap, we've added DNA codons data structure for a quick search for a amino acids based on codon triplets. We have added two more outputs and two more functions. Okay. And we also use our doc strings from now on to document our code. So we can see what the functions do just by pointing at them. Before I close, I wanted to recommend two more podcasts. Podcast number 252, which is very useful for people coming into the Python from a computational science like bioinformatics. How can Python help you? What tools are available for you? Okay, and the second one is number 237. It is titled A Gut Feeling About Python, and it's not a very descriptive uh, title, I have to say, but it is about bioinformatics, and what they mean by gut feeling is this person is actually working on gut biome bioinformatics using Python. Very interesting podcast, definitely recommend it. This is it for today. Thanks a lot for listening and watching. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below or pop in into one of our chats on Matrix or Telegram. These videos are also available on library platform if you are a library user. And you can always comment or follow me on one of these social medias that are listed here.
Until next time, Rebel Coder, signing out.